Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you everybody for joining. And this is our 17th webinar. And uh, I can't believe it as I was looking through it that it's actually our 17th. So we've been doing this 16 times already. And uh, we are intending to do this even uh, more. So this is our first one after the uh, vacation, the summer vacation. So um, thank you so much for um, um, having us and listening to us. Um, we have today a special invitee, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez uh, from Spain. Um, so um, uh, very happy to have him here. It's a special uh, event for us as well, because last night, Peter and Antonio were awarded the fellowship award from PMI. So congratulations, we're just discussing here that now they are kind of uh, in this brotherhood. So um, every time they will think about 2021 and the fellowship award, uh, they will be linked together. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a special event and thank you so much for, um, for joining us today to talk about a lot of things, you know, including strategy and strategy execution and project management and product management and how all link together. And tell us more about the European thought and uh, what's going on in Europe and uh, how we think about uh, things in Europe. So um, I will pass it now to Peter to officially introduce Antonio, but uh, very excited to, to have you here. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Thank you for the kind words and welcome my friend Antonio. It, it's really an honor for me to join you on this year's uh, PMI Fellow Award. It's the Fellow Award as you can see here is, is to recognize uh, people with, with service and contributions to the Institute and the profession. And um, there only were two awarded this year. So you have both of them here with you right now, um, which is uh, quite something and I guess um, my my mom was asking me how many there are. So I counted them out, Antonio. There's 82 in the fellow wow. right now in total. Now, as uh, we commented last night, not to say anything about Antonio, but some of us are, are, are of an age. So some of the 82 are no longer with us um, to go on. Anyway, so I'm pleased to have Antonio here. So I was thinking back. I can't remember when the first time we actually met Antonio, but we certainly got to know each other. Uh, when we served together on the PMI board for a couple of years. And you followed me as chair. Um, when were you chair again? In 2016. 16? Yeah, so a few years after me, uh, you were chair of the board. And we certainly touched bases during that time as well. Yeah. And let me just move here to my next slide. Um, so as you can see, I mean, besides Antonio being a great volunteer, one of the things that I was very impressed with was the thought leadership that he has had. And he's been recognized as one of the top 50 thinkers in the world. He's been viewed as a thought leadership of project management. He's published, as you see here, a number of books. And we're very excited to say his Harvard Business Review Project Management Handbook is now available. I guess the official release is in another two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. Two weeks. Thank you. But you can order it now on your favorite online bookstore. Um, so very excited that uh, you know Antonio has uh, joined, agreed to join us here. So unlike other pre webinars, we're going to be this. Have, this is very informal. Antonio and I will just have a chat about some of the things we're seeing in project management and some of the trends we're seeing. Um, Antonio was working on setting up a strategy implementation institute, so we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go through. If you have any questions for us, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat and um, or open up your mics. We're a relatively small group and we can join in on the, on the conversation. So enough about that. Um, let's get rid of the slides so that they can see us, Antonio. And um, let's get started here with, um, the, uh, with our conversation. So right. one of the things that we talked about when we were on the board together, um, and I guess I found out, I didn't quite know where it came from, but I found out last night, it was all your fault, um, was about the project economy. And I guess that goes back to your, your first book about the project revolution. Gee, I was looking, I didn't believe, couldn't believe that was over 10 years ago. 
I didn't think you could write a book when you were like 16. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was about the project of economy. So maybe we could start off and just think and talk a little bit about how you see today and in particular um, the importance today of thinking about the world as a project economy. Sure, Peter, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, with Joanna, with Lee to, to discuss without any scripts or just a, a chat around how we see the world and the opportunities. I think that uh, we're seeing and will be seeing in the next five, 10 years around projects, programs, uh, products, uh, agile. So uh, I think um, just to make it very simple, if you want, what I call the project economy is it's a shift, uh, a very important shift. Um, uh, I think most of us have been growing in a world driven by efficiency, where operations was the, it, at the center of every organization. Operations was pr driving everything, uh, business as usual. Uh, and around that, you had the, some other elements like strategy and marketing. And, and then in one place, you had uh, projects and products. And so very kind of not priority. If people had to choose when there was some, a decision to be made, should I focus on my day-to-day -day job or in project, 99.9% was they would go and do their business as usual. That's how they were scored and, and evaluated, line management. And, and that is been heavily disrupted in the last years uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robots, the COVID and pandemic. Uh, so there is a big bunch of operations. There's less need of operations. It has been decreasing over years, but this is just taking a big chunk. For example, today in a bank here in, in, in France, BNP Paribas, you don't find bankers. You find more technology people working in agile teams and projects than bankers. So that has really a, a, a big uh, before and, and now where most of the work in organizations is being carried out project-based. And project-based, I want to use the bigger word. Project for me is change, is value creation, is product management, is agile teams. I think we need to stop trying to um, yeah, find different battlefields and say, I'm agile, I'm project, I'm product, I'm program. This is the wrong battle. I think that doesn't lead to... Uh, to look to us as something relevant in organizations. So for me, that's the project economy. We're moving from a focus on operations, world driven by efficiency to a world driven by change. This is all about projects, not just project managers need to learn this. Now everybody needs to learn that. So that's also something that makes it very exciting, I think. I couldn't agree more, Antonio. I think, yep. you know, as we see organizations that are still hung up on this idea of Taylorism and efficiency, and even using projects to improve the efficiency, I think they start losing focus of what the customer really wants, right? And what the value we're doing, doing to the customer is. And especially with, as you uh, mentioned, this that technology coming in and how, um, people, creative people, innovative people have been thinking how they can use technology to solve customers' problems differently than existing companies. I mean, we talk about Uber and the taxi industry as being a, an example of, of how technology helps solve problems that people didn't really realize they had or just got used to having. So I think, you know, this, this idea that companies need to think about the world differently and think about how they approach the world differently is so important. Can you know? You mentioned value and about the idea of companies need to deliver value. So, how are you seeing organizations doing this and 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 trying to focus on how they measure, how they can ensure they are delivering value? That, that's a great question, and and please jump in also uh, with, with different views if you have. But I think. In the world driven by efficiency where operations was prime, most of the revenues were coming from operations. Projects uh, hardly deliver any value uh, on the short term, maybe in the midterm, who knows in the long term, right? But 80, 90% of the revenues were coming from selling products and operations. 
with operations being taken over and moving into project based, half of the revenues, revenues have to come from projects and new products. And so this is a, a, a completely different story. We're not used to deliver revenues as a project leader. We're not product managers. Yes. So I think the merge between products, programs, projects, it's just so necessary. And the other big thing around value is that if you look at the project life cycle, there's nowhere value. We have an initiation phase, we have planning, we have execution, monitoring and closing. Where is the value? Um, we make plans on deliverables, we make great plans on, on milestones, we artifacts, who know, nobody really knows what that word means, but we use artifacts. But where's the plan on the benefits? Where is That's the only thing that should matter. Well. And, and we don't have that. And, and, and so I think there needs to be a radical shift on creating value and fast. We need to do it fast. No company can wait today four years to see any benefits of a project. That, that's not happening anymore. The company will go bust. So we need to think completely different and very much focus on value creation fast. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's one of the things that led Joanna and I to write our book about you know, Gen P, new product owners, about focusing on delivering value coming out of projects, right? It's not the, as I say, is a tagline to the book is projects deliver products. Products is what delivers value and benefits. Um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting that you talk about this, you know, this idea that where is the value in the projects, right? In the project manager. And I know this is something that we've talked about before and, and thinking about from a project manager point of view, understanding more about the business. So, you know, as you, you wrote the project manifesto and talked about that, you know, can you maybe share a little bit more with some of your thoughts about how you think as a project manager, we need to grow, grow and have more skills in order to be successful in the project economy? Well, uh, I, I think, Peter, that then we had been trained very narrowly on on project management, if back to that project life cycle that we all have in mind, what happens before in initiation, which is innovation ideas, we don't have a clue. It, it was not covered by the books that we were learning. It was a clear cut innovation is not our piece of work. And I just figured out why not? When, when a lot of value is created in that piece and, and you, we should be learning design thinking and, and some ideas will never be a project but will become a prototype or MPV or I just don't, I, I have a lot of doubt questions about what we've been learning and for a very years and that project life cycle, I still don't understand why we miss the innovation part, why, why we miss that part, which I know you address uh, with you on in your book is it's crucial it's it's a lot i i'm doing a lot of sustainability uh project now i'm, I'm leading a big transformation on sustainability and one of the biggest challenges is introducing sustainability in the design in the early stages of the concept not when the project you have a a, a project plan that's too late 80 percent can be solved in the kind of ideation design the same with projects we never play there. So I think in terms of competencies, definitely we need to understand there. The other big thing that I don't understand, Peter, I can understand the origins. When the project is over, project managers run away. Yeah, even hopefully they stay until it's finished, but most of the time they just jump the ship. It's like, it's always like a ship is sinking, you know? Projects feel like when they come to an end, the ship is sinking, people start jumping, there's no really closure because the ship sinks very slowly. So there's still somebody working after three months, even the project was closed. And I just figure, I just don't understand why project manager, who's the person who knows more about the product or the new organization that's been set up or the system, why they run away? Why they don't take it over and run it and say, well, I want to run this organization. I've been working two years on that. There's nobody that knows more about this product that me, I've, I've worked for forever, uh, or this new system, why does it cut there and moves to operation? Why don't we say, let's continue? And that's where your point comes, understanding business and value and how uh, a project will deliver value when it's operational. And so I think that's two things that to, in my mind, 
I can see that when you were starting project management, working for the public sector, there's a start and there's an end handover. But when you're doing it within your organization, it doesn't make sense. So I think that's where the new uh, work will come, new concepts, new competi- um, new capabilities that we need to de- deliver. Um, I don't know some, if it makes sense, huh? Yeah, yeah. there's some chats about methodology. I'll come to that in a second. I just want to pick up on your last point. It reminded me that you know we're seeing in some companies, um, especially I think the banks here in North America, they're actually dropping project managers and just having product managers recognizing this point you just made, especially if you're using more of an adaptive methodology with shorter horizons that it's a continuous development. So why does a project manager fit in? So any thoughts on that? Are you seeing something similar in Europe? In Europe, what we see is that people are embracing project management as a core competency. Everybody needs to know it. I've been doing quite a lot of training where you train everybody, not just the 10, 20 project managers, but there's a big focus on delivering value. And this is what product managers have been very good at and and project managers very poor at. Uh, So I think I agree with you that if project managers don't wake up, even if we are in the project economy, that role is going to be taken over by product managers, managers who are shifting their job now to to be able to, uh, yeah, deliver more value uh, to the company. So I think it's a call for action for project managers uh, to learn product management, absolutely a core skill, because if you don't know what your project will deliver and how to achieve it, then uh, this is not really going to last very much. I, I see the current project managers a bit like the PMOs. If you remember, Peter, PMOs, they say that three out of four, they, they were killed after four years because people were not seeing the value. They were just pushing paper and making reports. And the same will happen with project managers if they don't move into that more agile space and product development. I do think that project management is still quite relevant, but it's a mix. It's a hybrid approach. Digital transformation, you cannot do only with agile. You need to have a program. You need to have projects below. You need to have some deadlines and budget. So it's always making that hybrid work and make sense is, is what I think is the future. That's what I see happening here. And, and I, yeah, I agree. I, mean, I think project managers need to understand why they're doing the product they are, where the value is, and keep that in the top frame of mind as they go through building the product or service. And to the point right. where there, if there's no value, stop the work, down tools, end it early. Instead right. of just saying, well, that's okay. No, just, as long as I'm on time, on budget, on scope, all is fine, right? And uh, like you said, I'm surprised as well that organizations, you know, at the end of the project, everyone disappears. Where's the knowledge going to go? Okay, yeah. jo- Joanna asked a question about methodology. So let's dive in and chat a bit about that. So I'll just read her question out here. Do you think uh, people like methodologies because it gives them a sense of protection? Uh, that there is a prescriptive way of doing things versus experimenting with new ways or that work for an organization. And maybe if I can can tell you the context, like I get yeah. that question a lot in terms of, so what is the first thing I get asked when I go to an organization is like, oh, so what methodology are we gonna use? So people feel that they there is a prescriptive way that will follow a certain recipe, three eggs, four spoons of sugar, and we know exactly how long it's gonna be baked. And then in the end, we expect something because we've seen it in a magazine that it's going to look very nice and then everybody will be successful. So I, that, that's what I, I keep saying, that instead of starting with something and trying to adapt or experiment what works for the organization to your point, to find that where value is and, and, and you know, lead to that discussion about value, they are focusing on methodology as if that's going to help them. Great point. Yes, Joanna. And, and I agree with your statement that uh, methodologies gives uh, a source or a sense of control. Um, I think if you look at uh, project management methodologies from Prince2 or PMI, they tend to produce a big amount of paper. 
you have the project charter you have i don't know how many locks you have a risk lock an issue lock a change lock um and and yeah the the feeling was the more paper you create so if you have 1000 papers for your project that gave a sense of well, these persons are super in control of the project, no? The more paper, the more feeling of control. And if you go to a meeting and just with one piece of paper and say, hey, I'm in control of your project, people are like, hey, panic. So that sense of uh, first uh, feeling of you are on top, you are in control because there's a lot of paper. And the second, what you say is, is, is true, is that people are expecting methodology so that you can repeat the results. So it's, I do think that you need some sort of recipe but then no dish is always the same you need to have the freedom to adapt it and to follow different steps depending every project is different every product is different so uh, i think methodologies are useful but it, not one methodology one size doesn't fit all we've seen doing that we've, we've done that for many years where we say use this project management methodology for all your projects and that was wrong because that just created more chaos and a lot of bureaucracy. And when Agile came, that's wiped away. Wait, we don't have any methodologies. And now it's very simple. We just have, uh, yeah, user stories and, and, and a lot of whiteboards with post-its. And that was a big change, but much needed. So I think part of our, our kind of teaching organization is you need tools, of course, but it's more important the people, it's more important the value, it's more important the culture. The tools are just tools to help you get somewhere, but use them and learn them according to what you need. Don't put it in the focus. The focus is somewhere else. At least that's my view. I don't know what you think, Peter or Joanna, on that. Well, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think in many ways, I see this as very exciting time for project management. I felt in some ways that when I first started and got my PMP back 20, whatever number of years ago, well, so don't think I want to think about how long ago it was. I felt that as a project manager, I walked around with the CPM hammer, right? Critical path method. That was it. Now we have a toolkit. Now the a toolbox. Now that's the good news. We have a toolbox, right? So I got a hammer and a screwdriver and a wrench and a crowbar and a sledgehammer and a saw. I got lots of tools to use, which is great, but I have to be able to figure out which tool do I use when. And that's going to be where the challenge is and going to be the opportunity. So we have, a, in some ways as a project manager, we have an opportunity to raise our, our skill and our value to an organization by saying to them, saying to them, you know, let me come in. I'm a now an ex, I've got the skills to look at, as you mentioned, your culture, the nature of the project, how much change is being introduced into the organization and to our customers, right? What's the nature of where the team is and where our customers are? And I can look at that and then say, okay, this is the best approach that we should use to deliver this product to ensure we're going to get the value at the end of the project. And, you know, we've never, you know, we've always been said, well, we got to use this. I was doing a, a, a little volunteer work for an organization here in Canada, KSO. And, um, you know, when I was brought on until I was the project manager. And so one of the volunteers on the team said, so where's the Gantt chart? no Gantt chart for this project, not appropriate, right? We're going to use an iterative approach. Yeah, we, don't know well, what we're, we don't know what we're doing. We're discovering as we go along. And, you know, the relief on that You're still there? You're still there? You weren't Yeah. <laughs> no, I was not throwing it. But the relief on their face is they recognize that, as you, you know, said, that often project management has this reputation of producing so much paper and bureaucracy and so on and not being flexible. But as we started off talking about the project economy, we need to be flexible. Exactly. Um, so Todd's just adding here, so about, if you understand you correctly, um, our old methodologies uh, did work, but now, is it, I get this correctly? I don't think that's, certainly that's not what I'm saying. The old methodologies, if you like, the traditional ones are still necessary. I mean, I would 
I, I struggle to think of how some projects can be done without using a critical path method. Although it was funny, I, if you remember Antonio, what was it, two years ago with the 50th anniversary of PMI, we had um, the head of the, um, from NASA, the head of the Mars mission, right? If you remember, and, and, you know, it, and I remember this, um, Scott Amber coming out after him and saying, because of the nature of his talk, he, he, he was uh, talking about how they developed the landing system for the rover on Mars. And you know, if you think any project in this world is going to be predictive, it's a mission to Mars, right? You have a, a very tight constraint to when you have to launch the rocket. If you miss it, wait four years, right? You are sending something far away that's got to work because I heard you know, another person from NASA talking about, you know, the service call to fix it takes a, a few decades to do. So, you know, very predictive, very risk averse. Yeah, Not here. anymore, Peter. Like we have SpaceX now. So oh, you know, no. if it's... they didn't, if they didn't do it like they are doing, it would have taken 20 years to do again. But well, look, right. look how it evolves. So that's the point this he was making was that you know they had a problem on with the Mars rover, how to land it, right? Because their old technology to land the Mars rover didn't work. And they used an iterative approach with creative and innovation to figure out how to land the ro these rovers, which are the size of a small car, on Mars, right? Mm -hmm. So even though you think this is predictive, it's not, right? There are parts of it that you have to use agile. And I think that's the magic we have to bring. So some cases, the waterfall traditional approach will be used. It has to be used because of the nature of the constraints that you have, how it works, but not everyone. Okay, anything you want to add to that, uh, Antonio? Well, I think there's a great example, which I'm researching a bit more. Uh, I did that for the book, but uh, it's the development of the COVID vaccine. Um, and, and it's a bit like that. It's, uh, it's a mix of program management with, uh, with agile and, and and quick, quick testing, uh, just selecting a segment. And, but we've done a vaccine in 10 months instead of 12 years. So if we can do that, because we carry out this amazing project where everything was done uh, great, according to the books, um, we can solve any problems. We can do any type of projects. We can replicate that formula. Uh, anywhere in organizations, in, in bigger problems uh, around sustainability or diversity. We have seen that in the last two years, how you can do a project which was thought to take 12, 15 years in 10 months. And this for me is extraordinary. It's like we are, it's terrible to say this, but we've seen how I, I feel like it, this pandemic was horrible, but somehow there has been a light where it says, hey guys and ladies, this is the way to solve your problems. We can show you, work together, have a strong sponsorship, 100% dedication, competitors working together, regulators stop bothering people and work together, make our life easier, let's work together. People embracing change much faster because there is an urgency uh, to change and embrace that and of course, uh, people are skeptical, but then you can see the impact and the benefits. So uh, I, I felt like we are in this dark world and then suddenly a light and say, this is the way, pick it up. And, and you can do that for your digital projects that usually take five years. You can do them in five months if you use the right approach. Now we have that. Yeah. Hello, Antonio. This is Todd McCoy from Alberta, Canada. Hi, to Todd. Tie Hi, to, to add to what you're saying, the COVID response, I worked for the federal government and they had to quickly have people contribute to the government of Canada by working at home. Like they had to change the network setups, the capabilities of people to work at home. They're not the only organizations, but an organization like the federal government, which typically takes a long time to do stuff, implemented this very quickly and very responsibly. And, you know, they gave out CERB checks, uh, aid checks to people right away, which typically isn't the way in Canada. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you, Todd. So I think, Todd, you know, you mentioned about technology changing and so on. 
I think, you know, this is what we're seeing is that the world is changing. So as project managers, we can't walk in with a hammer. We yeah. have to use different, different tools. And even working on the same project, we may need to bring in different tools. Trying to, the point I was trying to make with the Mars mission, which looks like a hammer, but we have to recognize that some parts during that project, we need to have a wrench, we need to have a screwdriver, right? We need to use... We, and this all goes back, and again, as Antonio mentioned, and I completely agree with him, we have to think about the value and how can we deliver value faster? Well, as I get, as my students ask me, as you, you know, I think I probably shared this with you with one of the classes we took, I, we took together that, you know, even in the construction industry, which has traditionally been waterfall and continues to be so for the most part, we're still seeing people starting building before they finished all the design. They wanna see what the market is like. They wanna see, in the case of high rise residential, what are people going to buy? And they'll readjust the upper floor design based on what people bought. And if they're buying one bedroom units, then they'll put more one bedroom units in, right? So even though they're doing parts of it predictive, I mean, you know, heaven knows, you're not gonna pour, build a roof before you have the walls to support it you still can do some iterative, Antonio's looking like, maybe you can do that, hmm. Um, you can still do some, um, use some agile and agility approaches. Um, okay. So I, I think I'm supposed to have the next topic ready to talk about now. I got so wrapped up in this one. I wanted to go back and, and talk a little bit about your, um, your book that's coming out and some of the work you've done with LinkedIn training around sponsorship. So maybe you could just share some of your thoughts of how you see the organizations and through the project sponsor setting up a project for success. Yeah, sure. Um, so first, maybe on the book uh, writing, I, I think um, I'm, I'm not like a super guru or bright super. I, I just wanted to write a book long time ago. Just thought maybe uh, try that project and leave some kind of vision on, on my views on, on projects and so on. So, uh, but then you get into it and then they ask you to write another one and another one. And, and uh, so I want to say that I think everybody can write a book. It's not something that you need to be a genius. Um, the thing is that once you write one, then it kind of, you say, this is the first and the last one, right, Peter? Right. <laughs> and then somehow you get asked and people like it and then you get into this. So I had written, published two books in 2019, just because I was writing one, uh, The Project Revolution and then Penguin, which is uh, a quite respected a publisher, at least here in Europe, is the one they publish in the books. In the airports, they, uh, we're, they said we're doing a new series for management. And one of the first books we want to publish is on project management. I said, wow, nice, because usually don't write about that. So I wrote it and then uh, I said, not again, no more books for five years, at least. This was 2019. And very soon after, my, uh, this Harvard said, well, our, our guide is super bold, is super old. The last project management book that we wrote is like eight years old. And we are see that there's demand that people want to know how to manage their projects. So they said, do you want to write it? And I, I could not say no. So another big mess and writing the book. And you know how it is, Peter, Joanna. It feels like never ending projects. But what I like about this project is they told me, write it for the non-PMs. So we have a lot of project management books and they're really always mostly for project managers, but there's 90% of people who are not going to be full-time project managers. They just want to do their work better, their projects. So it's very much focused for the non-PM. It's, it's just very simple terms, very simple tools. I have developed the project canvas and the other big focus, which I really like. And again, Joanna and, and Peter, you know, is we need to speak to the sponsors. Executives don't have a clue about sponsoring projects. I've done about two, three research. And, and I asked, do you think your executives are prepared? Do they have the competencies? 
to lead projects and about 85% of the people say, no, they're not prepared. They, they, they know partially, but they're not ready. Um, the same with the HVR, we did a survey, only 14% of the 600 executives said, I've received a training on sponsorship. So one of the biggest, biggest reasons and gaps, I think for project failure, we can talk about that, why the rate of failure in project is still so huge, is the sponsors. Uh, and, and with the book, it's, it's, it's really a big target for me using the platform of HVR, which is like probably the, the main thing that senior leaders read or the only thing and uh, to address it and tell this is your role, sponsor. And you need to be really proactive and you need to sponsor the projects and you need to support the project. Manager. So that's the two very important. And of course, anybody working in projects already can learn how to simplify, can to focus on, on value. But I wanted to address that field, which is uh, quite broad and there was not much uh, um, in terms of books or resources. Now, so I certainly agree with the sponsorship. It's interesting. Um, I was on the Priam community here. I'm going back to when I first got involved 25 years ago, talked about the need to train project sponsors. And I know one provider even developed a course for project sponsors, but no one took it because they're all too busy. Right. So that's one of the challenges that we have. So, so can, can I just ask a question on that? Because I think it's important. So the project sponsorship versus the product owner. OK, so what what's your view, Antonio, there? Because, I mean, project sponsorship is going back to that discussion that the project is a temporary endeavor. Right. So it's for the duration of the project. And then what? versus the product ownership that goes beyond the duration of the project and just keeps the focus on the entire product life cycle from innovation to all the maintenance and operations and promotion and pricing and everything. Well, I'm, I'm not expert in your field of product management, uh, Joanna, but what I would say is is very much the similar role that the product owner with the project sponsorship. It's an executive level. It's accountable for, for the value creation, the results, the bottom line, um, and then also accountable for bringing the resources and supporting the development. So I think in that respect, uh, um, I would say quite similar, uh, but maybe in product management, they are more familiar with the role, but in projects and transformations, they are not. It's, it's they're like Peter was saying, they, they love to start the project. They're always at the kickoff. You, you always see ex sponsors in kickoff huh? and they like to be in the picture and say, yes, we're going forward. And then you never see them again. Just like politicians. Yeah, it's like politicians. So I, I think that's very wrong. So maybe we can adopt some of the practices from product management and, and product owner, what do they do right that we can copy? Right, thank you. Where, where, where do you see the gaps from a product sponsorship or as we like to say, the owner of the product, where, where are the gaps that cause projects to fail, Antonio, from your research and your experience? Well, this is a, a, a topic which I love and I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. It's, I was reading the, the Standish report, the cows report, um, and, and I saw the figures and, and we've not got better in project success rates over years. It's 30, 30 uh, years. It's a third, right? Yeah. And it stays always around 30% success rate. Um, and despite all the trainings, despite all the methodology. So I have this LinkedIn newsletter on every tomorrow, probably. And I have a topic and I'm thinking, why have we not done projects better? Uh, I have my view, Peter, and I'd like to hear you both and other people in the call, but it's just appalling. I think there's very few professions where 70% of the things that you do fail. I don't know any other profession, to be honest, that 70% of what you do fails. Uh, um, professional and, baseball players. Yeah? yeah. Oh, hockey. Hockey. No, no. Well, baseball, because, you know, you have a, you hit the ball... Three, um, three out of 10 times and you get paid multi-million dollars. So you fail okay, seven out of so 10 times. That's a good, 
It's a nice reference. So that's the only one. Yeah. But, uh, so I want to go to the core of the matter. I, I think we ought to, to do that. I, especially now with the project economy, we cannot afford to keep failing that bad. And, and when the expectations are much higher. Uh, so my view, I just mentioned the sponsor because I think, I don't know from your point of view in Canada, but here in Europe, we always had the sponsor in the projects, always. There was the name and uh, often you did never see saw the sponsor, um, maybe occasionally. But my, I've been project manager and director of PMO many, many years. And the expectation was just hope that the sponsor will be there or hope that the sponsor will say, I need to get the training. And, and that never happened. I think the profession of project management was hoping that project sponsors will wake up and suddenly by whatever it happens, they will say, yeah, I need to do a training. And that was what we all thought in, in PMI. And, and I think that has to reverse. I think uh, I would say one third of the projects that fail are, are poor sponsorship. And I'm quite generous, maybe more. But I think what we need to do is now you're a project manager, go to the sponsor. The first person you need to meet and commit and get them engaged is the sponsor. Otherwise, don't start the project. Don't say, no, no, it's not going to work. And I want to see the sponsor. I want to tell the sponsor what is expected from him or her. Uh, I want to offer coaching. I want to offer uh, coaching on project management and I want to secure a meeting every two weeks uh, and want to make sure that the, the steering committees are scheduled in advance so that part which we are hoping we cannot hope anymore we need to grab it so I, I agree and I think there's two things that as project managers or product owners we need to do one is that we need to make sure that the product that we're producing on the project is linked to strategy. This is about your comments around benefits, realization, and value. And if no one can tell us how we're linked to strategy, then don't do the project. Don't create the product. It's going to fail. Right? So I think that's one thing we have to make sure and have the, the sponsor clearly articulate what that is or tell the sponsor if they can't. Figure it out if you can. If you can't, don't do it. The second thing that we need to be able to do is start talking the language of the sponsor, the language of business. I think, you know, we walk into these meetings as project managers and we go, oh my goodness, my CPI is 0.9, my SPI is 0.8. No idea what we're talking about. I don't know what we're talking about sometimes. But, you know, but even if we say we're over budget and late, so what? Connect the dots. What does that mean in terms of realizing benefits? What does that mean in terms of delivering value or not delivering value, right? So I think those are two things. Now, the third thing, name slipped my mind. I was a professor at McMaster University here in, in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada. You know, when they were looking at strategy implementation, one of the things that they did was they looked at the compensation plan of organizations. And in, in particular, the variable pay, the bonuses. And their belief was that if an organization wanted to implement a strategy, they had to align their variable pay to that so that people got their bonuses based on projects completing, products being delivered, value being created, hopefully aligning to the strategy. So I think that's another element that um, we can look at, you know, even as a project manager, if we have any ability or as a product owner, if we have any ability to control people's pay, try it, tie it to value, right? Don't let it be on, oh, well, you completed these deliverables. So what? Where's the value? Like Good taste suggestion. I like that one. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. I absolutely agree on, on what you're saying. We don't speak the language I, uh, of the executives. My life changed completely when I was director of PMO in a stop. Uh, talking about projects and, and methodologies and I started talking about value and what matters to them so I always tell my students uh, or project managers tell me what you do without mentioning the word project project management tell me what you do 
and they, oh, but we're used to it, say project management and project and no, tell me what you're doing and what's your value. And that has been fundamental shift because you start to learn talking around the business and the organization. The other nice tool that I propose is focusing on the why of the project, the purpose, not so much on the on the business case. I think in business case are important, but they are not exciting for people. Nobody really wants to work in a project has 10% return investment unless you get a cut of it, but that doesn't happen, like you say. So what's the purpose and, and how does it tie to what you say, the bigger picture? A, a quick example here in a telecom company, I was talking to somebody, project managers, I asked her, what's your job? What project are you doing? She said, I'm, 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 I'm uh, replacing, I'm putting a new HR system. And, and I say, what? Uh, and, and why are you replacing the HR system? So the new one has new functionality. We're struggling with people. They're not engaged. Uh, our employees are, 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 are yeah, leaving and, and talent is leaving. So the new system has functionality to create communities. We like social media and people will want to talk and we'll, we'll close the gap and we'll make them feel more at home. Ah, so, so that's the system. And why do you want to do that? Why do you want to make them feel better? Because we need more happy people. We want to keep talent and, and because that's going to uh, yeah make our company more successful. And you say just by asking three times why uh, you move from replacing an HR system to creating something that is much more engaging for the employees. So the step change, instead of talking about HR system with 99.9% of the people talk, if we move a couple of levels asking why, and then you put the smart objective, how do you measure? So 50% increase in the next employee survey by one end of the year, then that's such a powerful driver, much more than any business case that you can imagine. We're going to increase the engagement of our staff uh, by 50% by the end of the year. That's your project. The HR system is just a tool, uh, but you want to do more. And I think if we train project managers or product managers to talk on the higher purpose, that that's so different. It's a uh, woof. It's so big different. I really think that's that's so important. Um, and you know, as you go back, and I too have been watching the chaos studies. And, you know, you think about how back even before chaos. The Standish Corporation did this. Go back to the 50s when the critical path method and critical chain methods were all invented. It was all around tools, right? It was all about getting better tools to be successful. And we still were late. When I got involved with PMI in the mid-90s, it was all about soft skills, communications, and leaderships. The metric didn't move, right? So, you know, I think the next one is around business and understanding how we solve business, business problems. And again, that's not new. I'll give a shout out to another fellow Canadian, Dr. Francis Hartman from the University of Calgary. He published a book 20 years ago called Don't Park Your Brain Outside. I love the title. Um, but all he was, a, his premise was you can deliver a project late, over budget, under scope, and be successful. And surprise, 20 years ago, it's all if you communicate effectively with your stakeholders and you deliver value. You know? Exactly. And, yeah. and, I, and I've always remembered that. I mean, unfortunately, Dr. Hartman died far too young, but I always remember that as his, as that message to we have to think about value. And we also have to think about how we communicate to our to our stakeholders, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. If you look at uh, Sydney Opera House, it's one of the worst projects according to project management. The KPIs were terrible. And how can we say this is a terrible project? Uh, but that's what we built. So I think completely agree. It's, you can have a late project over budget, but over time, if it's successful, why should not we look at that? Why should not we monitor that? Uh, I think that's another big area we can do better. Yeah, and communicating. Um, so as we're coming up to the close here of our uh, hour together, it's going very quickly, if you have anyone has any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to either open up the mic or a small group or to add it into the chat so we can um, talk about this a little bit more. So as you're swallowing um, 
this getting your HBR book launched. Uh, what other projects do you have on the go, Antonio? What else are you keeping you thinking and your mind active at night? Well, Peter, I think, and Joanna, you know that once you have the book, it's how to make it reach to the most uh, people, that people embrace and learn and get better. So there's a lot going on. Luckily, with HBR, they have a huge, I had to call with their marketing team. There's 25 people. So they have podcasts that goes to 6 million people. So I, I'm, I'm lucky, to be honest, to, to have that platform. But it's just making sure that what we spend so much time developing, it's been uh, used, is people see the benefit. I think that's one of the biggest uh, part. Then I just launched this week and next week to LinkedIn trainings. Um, so also LinkedIn, very, very eager to, uh, to have new courses around projects and change and products. And they see the world uh, moving to, to what we were talking, driven by change. So a big demand of that skills. And then for me, I think the, the bigger project I want to learn, I'm, I'm busy with sustainability. I think one thing that we need to uh, learn also in project management is projects should not just be narrowed focused with their scope and goals. Uh, again, back to these 40 years focus on, on very narrow scopes and goal. We need to find ways to incorporate uh, sustainability diversity. So I want to research more on that and how can you incorporate it in, in the early stages of your projects, uh, uh, avoid thinking that sustainability is more costly uh, so there's a, 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 an area there which we can do a lot. It's just early stages, but I think it's, it's the future. Um, if we want to keep uh, this world uh, still alive, huh? if we want to go to Mars one day. Absolutely. And I know there's <laughs> an active community about sustainability. Um, Todd has popped in another question here that you talked about a little bit earlier about artificial intelligence. So any thought about what AI's impact could be on, on project management? Yeah, no, I love it. That thought, this is another great question, is there's very few professions where artificial intelligence has been less used than project management. Uh, we thought, how can, it's just amazing. We're still managing projects with Excel and my MS project. This is a software 40 years old. Can you imagine? And if you're a bit advanced, you use Primavera and... And maybe, uh, but it's crazy. It's we've not embraced technology, and there's a lot of the work that we do, which is very administrative, chasing information, making reports, even. Uh, so I, I hope, and I, I really have seen some people in Canada already working with algorithms, machine learning. They say that sixty to eighty percent of our current work will disappear, which I can't wait because <laughs> we will we will uh, be a force to do something else more into what we were talking earlier, Peter. So great question, Todd. I can't wait that technology disrupts uh, and helps to accelerate this new way of, of managing projects. Yeah, me too. I've seen some work that's been done uh, from a fellow down out of South Africa with neural networks around risk and estimating. You know, and I think that's a great opportunity where artificial intelligence can help out because that's so fraught with with bias with um you know the human frailty where we, we can use ai to help us out there's one area that can certainly help and so i think it's coming but you know as you said antonio it's surprising how slow some of these things show up in in certain areas yeah okay Thank you. well some, some great thoughts so Again, I know you're, you're very busy and I do appreciate you taking time to spend this hour with us and share some of your thoughts, and have a conversation with, with us. Once again, congratulations on the winning of the PMI Fellow. As Joanna mentioned, you and I will forever be linked as the two winners for this year, which is a real pleasure to be. So with that, um, I'll just go and put up our ending screen here and we'll wrap up. So again, thank you very much for attending. As always, our um, this will be recording this. We'll have the recording available in a day or so on the new Gen P website. Oops, I know Antonio wants to see more of his book being published. Look for the uh, this project management handbook coming to an online bookstore near you soon. 
Also, our book, um, New Gen, Gen P, New Generation of Product Owners Who Care About Customers, is available on Amazon um, for your reading pleasure. If you want to find out more about product ownership or anything else, don't hesitate to email us at info at newgenp.com or check our website, www.newgenp.com. So thank you again. We're working on our next speaker for November, so stay tuned. Uh, check our website and uh, we'll let you know. So thank you again for joining and have a good rest of the week. For those of you in Canada, have a great Thanksgiving weekend this weekend and we'll talk to you next month.